Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the Holy Scriptures. We are thankful, Lord, for your revelation of yourself within the pages of Scripture. We thank you for the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he came, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We ask now, Lord, the help of your Holy Spirit as we continue our study in the doctrine of the Trinity and then move on to the decrees of God. We ask your help in Christ's name, amen. We have looked at the history of the doctrine and we have sought to set forth the historic argument for the Trinity in uh, this unit, which is entitled The Holy Trinity, Part Two, The Doctrine and Scripture. And the argument that we have developed is this. Uh, number one, in Scripture there is but one God. Number two, in Scripture three persons are recognized as God. Number three, in Scripture, three persons are associated or related on an equal footing as God. Four, in Scripture, three persons are distinguished from each other. Number five, the tripersonality of the Godhead is eternal and not merely temporal. And then, Number six, the final point, in Scripture there are other indications of the doctrine of the Trinity. For example, different prepositions are used with uh, different persons in the Godhead. And then we went back to the Old Testament. Uh, when I developed the doctrine of the Trinity uh, in other lectures, I don't start with the Old Testament. I start with the New Testament. I start with the teaching of Jesus, particularly in John chapters 13 to 17, where the Lord uh, asks the Father to send the Holy Spirit. And then we have this uh, uh, interesting dynamic that goes on there. Because it's in the New Testament that we have the seeds of the doctrine of the Trinity. But having said that, once we frame out the doctrine of the Trinity in the New Testament, we go back to the Old Testament and we find that the Old Testament begins to take on some interesting new highlights to it. And so in the Old Testament, we find that God has a plural name, plural verbs are used of God, plural pronouns, uh, we even read in Psalm 110 of a plurality of lords, the Lord said to my Lord, uh, the Son of Yahweh. And that's where we are in the outline. I want to say a word about this uh, rather mysterious figure in the Old Testament called the Angel of the Lord. Uh, this too is a, uh, an argument, I believe, in favor of the Trinity. So I'm going to ask you to look at a few verses with me as we uh, think about the Angel of the Lord. And under this heading, I'm going to make uh, three or four points, so make sure you get these down. The angel of the Lord, uh, the word angel, of course, means messenger, uh, but uh, this uh, figure appears at certain times in Old Testament history, and there is some debate as to whether it is an angelic being or whether it is a Christophany, that is, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. So first of all, the first point I would make is that the angel of the Lord identifies himself with Yahweh, with Jehovah, that is, with God. For example, in the story of uh, the offering of Isaac in Genesis chapter 22, verses 11 and 16, Verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Verse uh, 16. 
And he said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you. That's an interesting thing. In verse 11, uh, just as Abraham is about to uh, slay his son, this figure appears called the angel of Yahweh, and he stops him. And then as the, uh, as the story proceeds in verse 16, this figure, the angel of the Lord, says, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. So the angel is identified actually with, with Yahweh. Okay, those texts, Genesis 22, 11, and 16, you can also write under this heading, Genesis 31, 11, and 13. Number two, or B, under this heading. First, he identifies himself with Yahweh. B, he is identified with Yahweh by others. And again, we'll look at Genesis, Genesis 16. Genesis chapter 16, verse 9. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, um, this is the story of Hagar. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Verse 13. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God who sees. So it's the angel of the Lord who is speaking to Hagar. And then she goes on to speak of the Lord speaking to her. C, under the outline, he accepts worship. The angel of the Lord accepts worship. Exodus chapter 3, the story of Moses. And now I could say to you, Moses is not in Genesis, but that's all right. Um, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush. Verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. So uh, it appears that God uses this uh, mediatorial figure, the angel of the Lord, but he is very, very tightly and closely linked to him. Also, Judges 13, 20 to 22. One other point. The angel of the Lord is distinguished from Yahweh. So in these other texts, he seems to be very closely identified with Yahweh, but then he is distinguished from Yahweh. For example, Genesis 24. Did I say Genesis? That's what I meant. Genesis chapter 24, verse 7. Now this is this great story about Abram, Abraham sending his servant to get a bride. Verse 7, the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth, and who spoke to me and who swore to me, saying to your descendants, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, he says to his servant, and you will take a wife for my son from there. So here the Lord is very obviously distinguished distinct from the angel, the angel of the Lord. 
You could also write down in your notes Zechariah 1, verses 12 and 13. So here we have a messenger from Yahweh, and at the same time, it is Yahweh. Now, how do we explain that? How do we explain that? Christians have traditionally explained it by saying that both those assertions are true. This is a messenger from Yahweh, and uh, it is Yahweh. It's a theophany. Uh, how do we explain that? Well, the general explanation is that this is actually a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. Now, why do we say it's Christ as opposed to the Holy Spirit or God the Father? The answer to that question is found in John 1.18, where we learn that it is the role of God the Son to reveal God, to human eyes, that is. That seems to be a distinct function of the, of the Son. Now, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, they do have icons that picture three thrones, and on the three thrones are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they're pictured as kind of uh, old Greek men. Uh, but that, that's kind of a tri, tritheistic uh, um, icon and uh, not something that uh, we should use to learn theology from. Number seven, the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. He's personal. He is distinct from God. He is eternal. And I want you to look with me at uh, Proverbs chapter 8. This is a case of personification. And the question is, should we at the same time go a little further and say that the wisdom of God is actually a person? And this is highly debated. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 1. Does not wisdom call and understanding lift up her voice? Verse 22. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old. Verse 30. Then I was beside him as a master workman. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of, in the sons of men. Now, the big debate over the question here is, is wisdom to be viewed as a, uh, well, as a member of the Trinity. Is this, in fact, a, a reference to God the Son, uh, personified here as wisdom? As I mentioned, it is debated, and uh, I'll, say a little, I'll say just a little something about the debate, and you can, if you want to write any of this down, you can use the opposite side of your uh, sheet. Karl Barth, the uh, famous Swiss theologian, very strongly argued against the idea that wisdom was Jesus Christ. He says, the word, John 1, in the beginning was the word, the word, he says, must be distinguished from wisdom and all other created realities. Now, Barth's argument is based on his reading of Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22, where it says, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. The RSV translates that, the Lord created me at the beginning of his work. Now, 
In my opinion, the translation of the New American Standard, the Lord possessed me, uh, is to be preferred. Now, Bart was aware of that translation. The translation created me in the RSV. I think, uh, just make a couple of comments. Number one, it reflects the low Christological presuppositions of the Arian heresy. Remember the Arians um, in my notes I have misspelled Arian. Bart, of course, was not an Arian and he abhorred that he abhorred that idea. Uh, the Arians, of course, uh, the forerunners of the Jehovah's Witnesses, followers, followers of Arius, believe that Christ was a created, created being. Secondly, uh, this view of Bart runs counter to the general meaning of the verb, which is kana, which is to get, acquire, possess, but it is not create. And so the translation of the NASB, the Lord possessed me, uh, is a preferable translation. Furthermore, Bart's view ignores the context. In the context, wisdom is distinguished from the creation. Just uh, note, the, uh, note the texts uh, that I read again. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old, uh, verse uh, 30 and 31. Then I was beside him as a master workman. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth. So. Wisdom is portrayed as working with uh, God, working with Yahweh uh, in, the, uh, in the creative process, which is, of course, what we find in the New Testament. Um, furthermore, the Lord Jesus Christ uses the phrase wisdom of God uh, with reference to himself in Luke chapter 11, 49. And the Apostle Paul says of Jesus Christ that all wisdom is in him, Colossians 2.3. And Paul the Apostle entitles Jesus Christ the wisdom of God in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 24 and 30. So I'm inclined to I'm inclined to believe that uh, this is a uh, an Old Testament indication. I certainly would not start there, but I do think it is a uh, legitimate <coughs> a legitimate argument. Yeah. Uh, is it because the New Testament passages that um, we see this as uh, God the Son as opposed to the Holy Spirit? It would be. God the Son, simply because of the New Testament references, where he is, uh, where he is referred to as but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Or verse 30, by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So the New Testament doesn't hesitate to use that expression, use that terminology of him. This is not our primary argument, of course. These are Old Testament indications. Uh, some scholars would uh, take the arguments I have given you, except for the angel of the Lord. I have a, in my files, I have a couple of articles by scholars who do not agree with me on this point, and there are others who do. Now just a couple of words uh, in conclusion on the doctrine of the Trinity. 
uh, first of all, the mystery of the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, it used to be common to have people uh, come up with analogies from nature, uh, which they use to explain the Trinity. I'm going to mention uh, a couple of them. Form, fragrance, medicinal value, yet one flower. That was Luther's analogy. In other words, he saw herbs that were used in his day, which had some medicinal value, and he said, well, there you've got the one flower, but it's got form, fragrance, medicinal value. Uh, W.E. Boardman, cloud, rain, mist, yet uh, one essence. Joseph Cook, sunlight, rainbow, heat, yet one solar radiance. O.P. Kruger, wax, wick, flame, one candle. Root, trunk, branches, yet one tree. Intellect, affection, will, yet one mind. Those two are from Augustine. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, yet logical unity, Hegel. Three leaves, but one clover. Who said that? Well, theoretically, St. Patrick, but I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> Eldridge Cleaver, who was uh, involved in the Black Panther movement, gave up Christianity. Uh, I remember when I was teaching high school, I read his book, Soul on Ice, and he was all he was saying why he, some of the illustrations that were used when he was in an evangelical church, and one of them was three in one oil. One of my students threw out one egg, shell, yolk, and white, which brought another student to say French toast, pancakes, and omelets. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, all of these things fail, really. They're, they're, they break down. Every one of them break, break down. They all lack the great one essential ingredient, namely, we're not talking here about, we're not talking here about persons. It is sometimes asserted that the doctrine is illogical. And in the uh, extensive article I gave you in your notes, uh, the Trinity in Scripture, which was in the Emmaus Journal. Uh, some of these things are discussed at length, particularly this question, is it, is it illogical? And of course, this is one of the big arguments. Thomas Jefferson brought this up as, a, as an argument against Christianity. The idea that you have uh, uh, three persons, uh, one essence, and uh, they would say that this is mumbo jumbo in arithmetic. How can three equal one? And, so, and those kinds of things. Well, we don't say there are three gods. We say there is one God. We affirm there is one God. We are monotheistic. Rather, there is one God with three distinctions in his being. Three subjects. Three persons. But there's one essence common to all three persons. Even Shedd tries his hand with analogies. 
Uh, he tries to get something that's more personal, so he takes the human personality, he says, which consists of subject, object, and relationship. But even there you have, uh, it's, it's inadequate. inadequate. Uh, even some scholars say they fi have trouble when we're talking about the Trinity of understanding exactly what we mean when we say person when uh, describing God. Certainly there are three differences, and these three differences are analogous to human relationships. And I would argue that it is the Bible itself that encourages the use of the language persons. Because the Bible speaks about God as Father and God as Son. And then when the Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit, the word spirit in Greek is neuter, and so normally you would expect uh, pronouns or verbs related to uh, the spirit to have some kind of uh, a neuter significance to them, ad adjectives and pronouns rather. But the fact of the matter is, in the case of pneuma, a neuter form, the Bible uses masculine pronouns, masculine adjectives when describing the Holy Spirit. Why so? Well, the indication is we're talking there about a spirit. The Bible says he. Uh, when he, he will do this, he will do that. Capital letter B, the importance of the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, I have a section on this in my article. And uh, in the book, we, we actually published a book with all of the articles from the Emmaus Journal on the Trinity. And uh, Mr. Dodders had an article in the, uh, in the book uh, which he published first in the Emmaus Journal, which is entitled something like The Practical Significance of the Doctrine of the, of the Trinity. Now, the doctrine is important. Number one, it's essential to a proper theism. It's essential to a proper theism. Strong says, neither God's independence nor God's blessedness can be maintained upon grounds of absolute unity. And here's the attribute that Strong mentions. The Bible says God is love. That's part of his essence. It's not said of uh, Allah in Islam, but it is said in the Bible that God is love. Now the question that faces us is this, how in eternity past uh, could God be loving if he was a solitary being, just one person? Love demands an object. And all agree, all acknowledge God needs there's a need for a subject-object relationship with love. It's interesting, by the way, that almost all anti-Trinitarians end up, end up being something like pantheists. They believe in the eternality of matter, or they, they end up being pantheists. But God is love. It doesn't just say he loves certain ones. The Bible says that, it uses that expression, he is love. Well then how is he, what is the object of his love? And the answer that Trinitarians give is, of course, the Father, <coughs> the Father loved the Son, the Son loved the Father. The Son loved the Spirit, the Spirit loves the Son. The Spirit loves the Father, the Father loves the Spirit. There can be love in the case of a triune God. Number two, it is essential to a proper revelation. It is essential to a proper revelation. If there's no Trinity, Christ is not God and cannot perfectly reveal God. 
Sunday school child will ask, what is God like? And we answer very truthfully, God is like Jesus. John chapter 1 lays out the deity of Christ very strongly. And it says in John chapter 1, verse 18, No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten or Son, uh, the only begotten Son, Himself God. He has revealed Him. Now, Philip asks Jesus, Show us the Father. And Jesus says, Well, now you've seen me. You have seen the full revelation of God. That's basically what, what His answer is. Furthermore, if the Holy Spirit is not God and the love and self-communication of God to the human spirit are not therefore a reality, if he's not, he's not God, but the New Testament assures us that we, our bodies, are the temples of the Holy Spirit. He indwells us. He brings assurance to us. It's because of the Holy Spirit's work that we can cry out, Abba, Father, He's the one who brings that inner assurance to our heart. Number three, it is essential to a proper redemption. It is essential to a proper redemption. The gulf between God and man is infinite. God, or rather Christ, cannot bring us nearer to God than he is himself. And so that's why there's a great stress, for example, in the book of Hebrews on, on the word mediator. Christ is the mediator between God and man. Paul the Apostle also brings this up. And he's the ideal mediator because he is God and man. God and man, both. So he's the perfect bridge between God and man. Only a God-man could provide an infinite sacrifice. You could find a, if you could find one sinless man to die, we might say that he could die for one other person. But Jesus Christ dies and that death has inf infinite value. How is that so? It's because he is God. He's the God-man. And only the God-man can be a perfect high priest. The Latin is pontifex for priest. One of the words, pontifex, from ponce meaning a bridge and facio to build. So he is a bridge builder. He is uh, the, the priest, the high priest, builds this perfect bridge between God and man. And he is, it is perfect because he is the God-man. Number four, it is essential to a proper model for human life. The doctrine of the Trinity is essential to a proper model for human life. Listen to Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Now, God didn't look down one day and see your mom and dad, the perfect family, and say, you know, that's neat. I like that. I think I'm going to adopt that as my name. I'm going to be, I'm going to be father. I like that. That's, that's great. That's, that's the exact opposite of what is true, says Paul. The the name Father that we use in our families, we derive that from God the Father. God the Father. And if God is a Father, there must be a Son. 
Augustine said a, an eternal father presupposes an eternal son. So when the Bible tells us that God is father and God is son, it's telling us something about his nature. These are not just arbitrary tags that are placed upon God. They are, they are names that tell us about his very essence, what, what he is. He is father, he is son. So they're not temporary functional terms. God is in essence a father. He, he communicates life, he generates life. That's what a father does, generates life. He has affection for his people. The Unitarian God is mere power, cause. And God is, in essence, a son. Where do we get the model of a receiving spirit where we depend upon God? <coughs> The notions of humility, self-sacrifice, submission, these are all God-like traits. How so? Because of God the Son. So the Trinity is a model of fatherly giving and caring and loving and of filial or son-like receiving, submitting, sacrificing, and so forth. We're going to stop there at this point, and uh, in our next class, we're going to begin talking about the doctrine of the decrees of God.